hello. My name is Jake Kovalt. I'm the PI of the Quantitative Classics Lab at the UT Austin uh, Bureau of Economic Geology. Uh, Fairfield kindly invited me to present some of the work our lab is pursuing to better understand subsurface heterogeneity in clastic units of the Northern Delaware Basin. We're really grateful for, to Fairfield for access to um, a spectacular data set in the uh, Northern part of the Delaware Basin, the Red Tank 3D Seismic Survey. And um, this survey really underpins a lot of our work. Before we get started, I wanna quickly highlight a major research thrust of our lab. It's the importance of heterogeneity. Um, so what is heterogeneity? Uh, well, it's defined by Lake and Jensen as the spatial variation of properties. And, and that's what we're trying to figure out in the subsurface, just how properties are distributed so we can make better informed you know, predictions in places where we don't have uh, you know, a great understanding of what is in the subsurface. And for slope to basin floor stratigraphic units, depositional systems, these are two end member uh, uh, insights into stratigraphic controls on heterogeneity. On one end of the spectrum, more confined systems uh, are limited in aerial extent or, or in width, but then they stack vertically so they can be really well connected vertically and have relatively high KV, KH. On the other end of the spectrum, deposits uh, tend to be a little bit more sheet-like and a little bit more layered. Um, these commonly are deposited in unconfined settings. Uh, as a result of being uh, not amalgamated, the KV, KH tends to be relatively low. Um, so that's kind of an unconventional perspective of uh, heterogeneity. But we're after uh, questions in the Permian Basin that um, relate to more tight and unconventional slope and basin floor reservoirs. Um, so for example, uh, we have two models here, uh, one for a uh, clastic lobe facies model or fan facies model in a, in a conventional type of environment like the Paleogene section in the Gulf of Mexico, in the deep water Gulf of Mexico. And, and then on the right, you see another heterogeneity scenario, similar sized units, similar si geometry of deposit, but the distribution of facies is, is very different um, in this unconventional uh, unit of the, the wolf camp in, from the Northern uh, Delaware Basin, published recently by our colleagues at Devon. Uh, besides just understanding uh, facies and uh, facies distributions, but we also want to understand how those facies stack to form larger depositional units or architectural elements. So again, on the left is a depositional model for the conventional deepwater Wilcox formation in the Gulf of Mexico, which comprises extensive sheet sands up to tens of feet thick that are interstratified with regional mudstones. Um, to the right is a different depositional model of a basin floor fan we've been developing for the tight Leonardian sprayberry formation in the Midland Basin. The uh, depositional architectures, how they stack is very different in the Wilcox example um, compared to the Sprayberry example. And we're interested in why it's different and, and exactly how they're different. So uh, we've been doing a lot of work on these types of systems in the Permian Basin that might um, diverge a little bit from you know, conventional thinking about uh, you know, conventional reservoirs and their heterogeneity. If you're interested in learning a li little bit more, you can see our recent ERTEC and APG subsurface workshops it's uploaded to the BEG uh, YouTube page at the address above. Um, you can also feel free to contact us at, at the QCL for more information. My, my email address is down there as well as the co-PI of the lab. And then our, our website is there as well. So now onto our study, leveraging Fairfield subsurface data um, of the slope to basin floor reservoir heterogeneity, heterogeneity of clastic units in the Permian Basin. We're going to use the uh, Brushy Canyon formation as an analog for other clastic basin floor reservoirs uh, within the, the Permian Basin to try to understand how depositional elements are organized from slope uh, to basin floor. And uh, we're also interested in trying to use the Fairfield subsurface data, the 3D seismic that I mentioned before to define the architectural elements in the subsurface and compare them to those that are outcropping in the nearby Guadalupe and Delaware mountains. And we're also gonna address uh, based on our comparison of some early models of the Brushy Canyon formation from outcrop and our subsurface insights, where the Brushy Canyon formation might be applicable in a as a reservoir. And a spoiler alert, we think that the 
uh, the, some of the characteristics that we're documenting for the brushy are applicable to a, the whole host of prospective clastic uh, units on the slope and basin floor uh, in the Permian Basin. That's both the Delaware and the Midland Basin. So here's a paleogeographic map of Pangaea during the Middle Permian by Ron Blakey. And I've highlighted the Permian Basin in a black uh, dashed box. So the next slide is gonna be um, in that black, black dashed box. So zooming into the Permian Basin, here's a map by some ExxonMobil researchers who studied the Brushy Canyon formation outcrops in the Delaware Mountains as analogs of other basin floor uh, turbidite reservoirs. Here's a stratigraphic diagram of the units of the Northern Delaware Basin, including upstream carbonate units that transition downstream to silica clastics of the Delaware Mountain Group, which includes the Brushy Canyon formation at its base, and then it's overlain by the Cherry and the Bell Canyon formations. And all, all these uh, strata are all Guadalupian in age. And then here's a photograph from the guidebook of Brushy Canyon formation outcrops from proximal uh, to the Northwest to distal to the Southeast. So you see the Guadalupe Mountains way in the distance and then the Delaware Mountain Mountains in the, in the foreground. And uh, those are the rocks that these researchers studied to develop a uh, depositional model that uh, led to the conceptual model, to a conceptual diagram that looks like this, where you can see low sinuosity channels that transition downstream to more sheet-like deposits of weakly confined channels and lobes. So you have the map view, the dashed red line represents the, out, the Delaware Mountain outcrop belt. And then um, they've got some characteristic cross sections of what they see in the different outcrop belt from upstream to downstream where you get progressively more sheet like. So how do these outcrop uh, interpretations compare to the subsurface? Well, let's take a look based on Fairfield's 3D seismic data. So here is that location map again. And now we've indicated the location of Fairfield's red tank survey. It's uh, in southeastern New Mexico. The next slide is going to show a cross section of the Guadalupean shelf margin uh, that leads uh, down into the basin into the red tank survey. So this line, uh, so, so to the left is a line that's courtesy of our good colleagues at BEG's Reservoir Characterization Research Lab. Uh, to the right is where that 2D line intersects with Fairfield's red tank uh, 3D survey. The red horizon that's uh, illustrated here, that's the base of the Brushy Canyon formation. The blue line is the top of the Brushy. Upstream to the left, we can see the steep basin margin at Brushy time. And this basin margin transitions to be much flatter uh, across several tens of kilometers into the basin. Let's take a closer look at the red tank region that's, that's to the right in this diagram. So this is a strike view in the distal or southern part of the Fairfield seismic data set. Uh, formations are indicated, um, they're written there, Wolf Camp, Bone Spring, Avalon, Brushy, Cherry Bell. Uh, I've also indicated the top and base of the Brushy. Um, uh, the base is red, the, the top is, is blue, uh, just like in the last slide. And in this strike section, we can see a little bit of the character, the seismic reflection character of the Brushy Canyon formation that looks to have moderate to high amplitude, generally discontinuous to moderately amplitude seismic reflection character. Uh, you also see thickening to the left away from, um, there's a fault at depth. And we can also see the overlying cherry and bell um, and and the salt of the Castile Formation that's over the top of the cherry and the bell here. And so, I mean, again, the Permian Basin is an, is an exciting place to work because it has a little bit of everything from clastics to carbonates to salt to structure. So now we're a bit more proximal to the north and zoomed into the brushy. Uh, there's a new horizon that's pink, which is a regionally mappable horizon separating upper and lower sections of the brushy. There's also a slightly different seismic character uh, that's, a that's separated from the uh, upper and lower brushy, as well as a slightly different wireline log character. So in the middle of the screen is a gamma ray log showing a blockier, thicker, low gamma ray responses of the lower brushy compared to rattier, thinner, more layered gamma ray responses of the upper brushy. 
and you know, correspondingly, the seismic reflection character in the upper is a little bit more continuous, a little bit more high amplitude, and then it's a lot more isolated and discontinuous high amplitude in the lower brushing. So this leads us to an interpretation of uh, something like this. Um, with more isolated thick channel deposits in the lower brushy and thinner, more layered sheet-like deposits in the upper brushy. So we can take this interpretation um, from our Fairfield data that we were able to use a step farther by uh, leveraging a tool our lab has uh, developed called Chronolog. And Chronolog correlates logs in 3D. We use it all the time and we really can't imagine correlating hundreds or thousands of logs in the Permian Basin or other data dense basins without it. So here we're looking at a west-east approximately strike section similar to the depositional model in the previous slide. Um, again, uh, so we got the well in the same location as well. And you can see the lower brushy has these more isolated uh, sand packages um, transitioning or pinching, but like a little bit less variability with background, what might be background uh, uh, deposits, deposits, you know, that are over, that are laid down as a result of background sedimentation, raining out of suspension, that kind of thing. And then in the top uh, part of the, the upper part of the brushy, uh, you can see much more layered, uh, more layered like sheet-like geometries in the uh, chronolog section. So if you'd like to learn more about this technology, please see uh, our recent article in APG Explorer, or you can contact the uh, person who, who developed the technology. He's a co-PI of our lab. His name is Zoltan Sylvester. His email address is provided uh, below. Again, we really can't imagine correlating hundreds of thousands of wells uh, without this in places like the Permian Basin. Uh, finally, a comparison of the thickness trend we mapped in the Fairfield seismic data and the trend from Chronolog. Uh, we think that they look really, the trends look really similar. One, you know, one is in depth, that's the chronolog interpretation. We have an isochron map there, and then we have an isochron map in to the right from, uh, from the Fairfield seismic reflection data. Um, the fact that they're similar is really hopeful. It gives us a lot of confidence in our subsurface interpretation that's integrating both the seismic and the wells and using that chronolog technology to, to correlate a bunch of wells in relatively short order. Um, so to try, so we have some depositional models in mind. You know, the brushy has these isolated channels at its base, and then it's more sheet-like at its top. Um, let's look at some map views in the Fairfield seismic reflection data uh, to confirm some of the depositional interpretations that we've mostly reached based on examination of lots, lots of cross sections. So here we're looking at a um, spectral decomposition map at the base of the brushy. And what we're gonna do is look at an animation that transitions from the base of the brushy through the top. In the lower right corner, you can see uh, that depositional model that we drew uh, based on the, the cross section that I showed you from the Fairfield seismic reflection data. And I've got a little arrow about approximately where we are in the section. So the arrow is near the base of the section. So we're looking at the base of the section and we're gonna move up towards the top. And we're gonna see how this how the, um, the map patterns change through time. So I've also highlighted a few channel forms in white dashed lines um, to help you see them a little bit better in the spectral decomposition image. But basically, um, this is really providing exquisite views of what some of the more weakly confined lower sinuosity channels of the brushy look like. Some really thick channel complexes, or wide, I should say, wide channel complexes that we can see here, a little bit more isolated. And then as we move up into the upper part of the brushy, there's a lot more relatively narrow, looks like maybe even distributary channels. And at the very top of the section, we can see what looks like a distributary pattern in the upper left and a number of relatively small channels that are emanating from some kind of point source. Look kind of almost fan-like in map view. So this, these are all those channels that we picked in Fairfield seismic data laid one upon the other. Uh, we've color coded it according to age. So the older the channel, the darker the blue and the younger the channel, the lighter the green. Um, so that's all of them on top of each other. So it looks like the sandier, the coarser grained architectural elements, the basic building blocks of the Brushy Canyon formation in this location of the basin floor, they're composed of these 
uh, weakly confined low sinuosity channels, but there are apparently changes as you go from the lower brushy to the upper brushy. So here's a look just at the lower brushy channels, you know, a lot more isolated channels, just like we saw in our cross section, and then a little bit more fan-like, a little bit more, um, uh, a, a number of, a, a larger number of smaller channels that are uh, spread out across the whole of the uh, upper brushy. That's all of them together again. So we can compare the upper brushy to the lower brushy. We can look at some of the channel widths and how they might change. Um, they actually don't change very much. What you see in the upper right is a histogram of channel width of, of first of the lower brushy and then an orange of the upper brush and they overlay each other pretty well. Um, to the left, you see line drawing traces of the channel forms that we mapped in Fairfield seismic reflection data. Something that's hopeful about our observations from the seismic reflection data that these are real and um, meaningful depositional geometries is that the widths of these channels, these brushy basin floor channels from Fairfield seismic, it overlaps with the widths of channels that have been uh, collected in a global database of outcrop data that was published by Tim McCarg in 2011. That's what that histogram on the bottom is. We can also look at thicknesses because we have wells that are tied to the si to the Fairfield seismic. And uh, if you start to interpret those relatively uh, coarse grained low gamma ray responses as individual channel element deposits, the thickness distribution of those channel deposits in some of our wells overlaps nicely with the thickness of channelized deposits in outcrop from the same data set of Tim McCard. So that brings us to one of our primary questions. How do the outcrop base interpretations compare to the subsurface? Remember this model that we uh, discussed of the turbidites that are cropping out in the Delaware mountains where you get these weakly confined channel deposits and low sinuosity channel deposits that transition downstream to more sheet like deposits. Uh, well, I, I think that they are really similar to what we're documenting in the subsurface with the Fairfield seismic data. Um, as in, as a, an example, to the left, we have our traces of the channelized um, depositional elements that we mapped from Fairfield seismic data. And then to the right are a couple of evolutionary models of transitions in the Brushy Canyon formation that were interpreted by the, uh, af the, uh, the authors that I mentioned earlier. And I'll be, uh, I'll be darned if the geometries in the cartoon from the outcrops don't look a heck of a lot like the uh, geometries that we've very carefully mapped in Fairfield seismic data. So where is what we've documented applicable as a reservoir analog? Well, we think it's applicable to a host of clastic units in the Permian Basin. Again, to the left are the upper brushy and lower brushy uh, channel maps that we uh, picked from the Fairfield data. And then to the right are some maps of the Sprayberry formation, different age, it's Leonardian, not Guadalupian, in a different basin, in the Midland Basin. And you see a lot of similar, this is a, these are two maps that were generated by Chronolog. Uh, and the colors represent V-shale with the lighter colors being, being lower V-shale and the dark colors being higher V-shale. And we've actually been able with that chronolog technology to map individual channels and fan shaped bodies. And again, these are plotted at the same scale as the upper and lower brushy channels to the left. And they look really similar, they look very analogous to us. Um, so that's in conclusion, I just wanna recap what we talked about. We, you know, we're interested in trying to understand a basin floor and slope um, heterogeneity, how depositional elements are organized from slope to basin floor. And we have a great opportunity leveraging Fairfield's seismic reflection volume in the red tank region to say some really meaningful things about heterogeneity, heterogeneity in the Brushy Canyon formation that we think are broadly applicable to the clastic units in the Permian Basin. I wanna thank the sponsors of our lab when this work was performed in 2019 and 2020. And those folks are are illustrated here. We also are really great for, grateful for um, software donations that were able to, that really enabled us to do a lot of this subsurface mapping. And of course, we want to thank uh, Fairfield for access to their beautiful uh, seismic reflection data in the uh, northern part of the Delaware Basin. So thank you very much.